Well, good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath. And uh, welcome to the Friday night study. And uh, we're going to continue looking at uh, M.L. Andreasen and the history of evangelical conferences. Uh, we're starting on chapter three of his book. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we invite your presence into our hearts, into our homes, into our lives, and into this study. Lord, we, we need you. You see all things, you know all things. And you have purposes that we can only trust in. We have um, limited understanding of your word. We know, Lord, that if we abide with you each moment, that you can guide us and that you can strengthen us and help us. We pray for each person who participates in these studies, those that watch them, those that contemplate the truths and that search for themselves in your word to know what is truth. We just pray that your angels can watch over them, that you can guide and direct them and speak to them, speak to each one of us. And that we can hear your voice and obey it. We thank you for the Sabbath and the blessings of rest in Christ. Rest from our sins and freedom from the burden and the bondage of sin. We know, Lord, that many people have not experienced your peace. And they need to hear a message that will bring them and draw them to you. And that we can reflect your character. So we just ask again for your presence as we open your word together. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Well, good morning again, everyone. Now, um, as you can see, we've got chapter three here. So we've been studying in M.L. Andreasen, and he's going to tell us about some of his experiences and the significance of them. And uh, what he understands about the spirit of prophecy, there's a bunch of things uh, that he's going to discuss. But uh, we were talking before the study about the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And so I thought this is kind of appropriate for what he's going to talk about here, because we are Seventh-day Adventists. But many of us have do not have a great relationship with with the conference churches or sometimes we don't even have really a local church that that accepts us doesn't mean that we believe that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is Babylon and that we need to leave the Seventh-day Adventist Church and form a new organization and call people out of Adventism. We don't believe in that at all. We believe that um, the Seventh-day Adventist uh, message, the church was set up by God and that God is going to um, reform his church, though we don't necessarily believe that that has to be an organizational structure that exists. And one of the reasons is uh, a quote that I'm going to read um, and what we see. So we never take the position that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is Babylon because prophetically it can't be Babylon. It's the Jews. It's, it's Judah. It's God's church. It's Jerusalem. It's God's people. It's Israel, right? It, it, Israel never becomes Babylon. Judah never becomes Babylon. But we know, of course, that uh, churches can be an apostasy. But the focus is not to be upon the faults and mistakes of the church, because often people gloat over the fact that the church is an apostasy and they, of course, are righteous. And, and the reality is all of us are sinners. We are Laodiceans. We belong to the Laodicean church. The Laodicean church isn't just the organized Seventh-day Adventist church. It's us, and we have to believe what God says about us. Now, I'm going to look at this quote here, and this is from First Selected Messages, page 204 and 205. So this statement it says, the enemies of soul, the enemy of souls has sought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation was to take place among Seventh-day Adventists, and that this reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith. 
and engaging in a process of reorganization. Were this reformation to take place, what would result? The principles of truth that God in his wisdom has given to the remnant church would be discarded. Our religion would be changed. The fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be accounted as error. A new organization would be established. Books of a new order would be written. A system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. The founders of this system would go into the cities and do a wonderful work. The Sabbath, of course, would be lightly regarded, as also the God who created it. Nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. The leaders would teach that virtue is better than vice, but God being removed, they would place their dependence on human power, which without God is worthless. Their foundation would be built on the sand and storm and tempest would sweep away the structure. So if we if we look at this quote, so main thing here is about the books of a new world. That's what I'm focusing on. So we know that the, the Seventh-day Adventist Church um, in 1919, there's a book published that marks the beginning, I believe, of the third generation, and that's the book The Doctrine of Christ by W.W. W. Prescott. And the influence of Prescott is what leads ultimately to the book Seventh-day Adventists Answer Questions on Doctrine. And so those two books, when it, she says, you know, this reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith. Um, the doctrine of Christ, it's, it's going to uh, emphasize Christ and downplay the prophecies that point to him. Seventh-day Adventist question on doctrine even does greater attacks upon some of the foundational truths, the investigative judgment, and of course, the nature right. of so this, this book, Questions on Doctrine, I believe, is, is the result of a work that had begun earlier. And um, so in that third generation, it, I believe that the book, Questions on Doctrine, marks the beginning of the fourth generation of Adventism. So there's four generations. It comes from the book of Joel. So, you know, that's just, I, mean, I don't want to go into too much detail on that. I want to get back to, to this, but when it comes to the idea about the, the church surviving, well, if the structure is going to be swept away, if, the, if they have created a new organization and the books of a new order, then we would expect the structure be, to be uh, swept away. But it doesn't mean that Seventh-day Adventists are going to be swept away. The true, the ones that are following God, will be able to stand that test and trial. But the structure itself won't be there. And I've never, well, it's been a long, long time, but I don't think I've, I've ever believed in the structure. In, in all of my studying of Adventism, I never find that Ellen White says that we need to just, you know, stay with the ship or trust the church or anything like that. It's, it's our focus is upon Christ and dependence upon him. Okay, so anyway, we're going to, if there's any comments on any of that, feel free to comment um, before we start reading from Andreasen. Okay, so anybody can comment at any time. Just interrupt me. Years ago, while traveling in northern Minnesota, I stayed one weekend in a small town, and there was no train service on Sunday, and buses did not exist. I did not like to remain idle, so I arranged for the use of the town hall with the intent of holding a public service. I posted a handwritten notice that I would speak in the afternoon on the topic of Seventh-day Adventists. I confess that I would rather not have spoken, for I needed a rest. My post posted notice would certainly draw, not draw many people. To my surprise, the hall was well filled. As the people showed interest in the subject, I decided to appoint another service for the evening. Promptly, a well-dressed man arose in the audience, introduced himself as the temporary pastor in the only church in town, and invited me to come over to his church and speak in the evening. I reminded him of my topic, but he stated that this was satisfactory and I could come over and speak on Adventism. I thanked him and accepted the invitation. 
After the meeting that night, he told me that he was almost sorry he had invited me. When I heard you this afternoon, he said, I thought you were an intelligent man. Now I know you are not. What made you change your mind? You said you believe in Genesis, don't you? Of course not. No intelligent man believes in the Genesis creation story. You don't believe in the Old Testament then? That's, of course, Andreasen asking that question. The pastor answers, no intelligent man does. Do you believe in the new? Well, yes, there are many good things in it. But when it comes to Paul, I draw the line. He is the cause of all our troubles. What about Christ? Good man, very good man. Of course, he had his faults. But he was a good man? Are you not a minister? Yes, in a way, I am president of the seminary. I'm up here on my vacation and am temporarily substituting for the pastor here in town, one of my former students. And this led to a conversation that lasted most of the night and was very illuminating to me. I was somewhat acquainted with his institution and one of my teachers was attending some classes there. Do you teach your students what you have told me tonight? Yes, and much more. And do your students tell their congregations? Oh my, no, that would never do. The people are not ready for it. They are much more conservative than the preachers. We have to move slowly with them. This episode came to mind as I have considered the situation and our denomination of late years. I've been uneasy since I first heard that our leaders were negotiating with the evangelicals, but had hoped that the blandishment of our churches being reckoned among the established churches as being one of them would not appeal to our men. We had heard too many sermons on the text. The people shall dwell alone and shall not be reckoned among the nations to be deceived. And that's a verse from Numbers 23, 9. As the negotiations were considered top secrets, it was some time before any definite news leaked out. And when it did, it was disturbing. Washington furnished little news and all others informed me that they had nothing to say. It seemed apparent, however, our leaders were being influenced and steps were being taken that would be hard to retrace. Definitely those steps have led us down a path of where we are today. The first authentic news did not come from our leaders or through our journals, but from an evangelical publication dated September 1956, which, which issued a special edition with an account of what had taken place. This account was so unbelievable that we hesitated to give it credence. We were sure that what it reported had never taken place and that our leaders would promptly issue a denial. We waited a year. We waited two. But until this date, no protest or denial has been issued. Reluctantly, we must, therefore, accept the account as true. Let us consider the situation as it has developed. As I read the review from week to week, I find the articles generally helpful. The contributors quote freely from the spirit of prophecy as do the editors and feature writers. And there are times when I disagree with certain positions, which I consider unsound, but this is not often. And there are at times reports that savor of boasting, and at other times much stress is laid on statistics. But I have learned not to take too seriously some minor matters. I read the review with confidence. I enjoy it. I can say the same for the signs of the times, but not so with the, with the ministry, our ministerial journal. The general articles are of the same kind of qu and quality as the review, but this is not always so with the special features and editorials. These I must read carefully and critically. At times they contain what I consider heresy and dangerous perversions of truth. This may seem a serious charge, and it is so indeed. I can best illustrate what I have in mind by presenting a concrete example. So imagine if Andreasen was to read the review today, right? So we can see that, that this has progressed from what had happened there. And, and the thing that's interesting here is that when you look at ministry, which is to our ministers, they're bringing in things to the ministers first that the people aren't ready for. And I remember, and I've mentioned this story before, but the pastor who baptized me just said that he was a Ford man. The problem was that Ford moved too quickly, that he was overconfident that people would accept his ideas. 
And now there's another statement, and, and I know I can't remember if it was Froome who made the statement or someone else, but it, it had to do with our understanding of Godhead. And um, and the statement was made, well, we just have to wait for this generation to die that's going to hold on to the false ideas of the Godhead. And the new generation, we have to train them when they're young, basically, and they will accept it. And And a lot of that is true when it comes to the changes that happen in the church. It's not the people themselves that change so much, but it's from generation to generation that these changes happen. Now, of course, sometimes the the foundation is laid and then you can have a sudden shift in ideas that 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 seems sudden. So, for instance, within Adventism, there's uh, a strong influence that has uh, Seventh-day Adventists accepting homosexuality, the LGBTQ community. And and that's rather sudden and drastic. Now, the church is always a little bit behind the world, but it also happened in the world rather suddenly. But it, it didn't. What you see is that seeds were planted long ago. They've been watered and nurtured. And it's only when the thing, when the plant bears fruit, that we see the results, correct? So what we're looking at here when we're, we're doing this study is we're looking at back when these these seeds were planted and we can see the result much more clearly now. And I mean, maybe this isn't even when they were planted. This is when they first start to have an effect. These plants are growing. So and in the church, in the church. In the... Yeah, Jeff, go on, explain it. That's not just like in the Adventist church, corporate, corporately speaking. Yeah, yeah. So the ministers move faster than the congregations, um, but they, they plant their seeds or their ideas knowing what they're doing. That is, they have a goal, a plan for Adventism, where many of the members are not aware of what this plan is. And... You know, and, and it's always presented in a positive way. And, and it's quite, quite amazing the skill in which it's done. So, for instance, Felix can comment on this if he wants. But when we were there, they were dealing with this woman's ordination issue. And the two women who were ordained, one is they were young. Um, the one was, I would just say she was simpler, right, and innocent. Uh, the other one was, you know, somebody who was brought up in that church and had been a nominal Adventist and all of a sudden, you know, is now converted. And and there's no way that you would oppose those people, right? It, they didn't bring in some, you know, uh, rabid sort of, you know, feminist type that everybody could object to who had all kinds of false ideas. They, they put people in place that would be hard to oppose, right? So it's very clever on their part on how they, they approached this, these women pastors. And, and so we can see that they're, they're not just fumbling through this. They have a well-designed agenda of what they want to accomplish within Adventism. And they, for the most part, have been successful. In that quote, it says, nothing will be allowed to stand in the way of this new movement of this new organization. And and we've seen that that's the case. They they know how to strategize. And one of the things, of course, that they do is keeping things secret. Um, And I've told this story before, but I was was watching some videos. This guy was talking about like social skills, right? Something that, you know, I lack a little bit of. And, um, but he was talking, uh, he was using an example within the mafia, and which so I just thought it was kind of interesting. I definitely would never use it, but it was about how the mafia uh, uh, gets what they want. And he referred to a movie which I've never seen, but but I've heard of uh, um, the Godfather series. And I guess in the movie or something, there's um, a strategy that that the Godfather is using to look like he wants to bring these organizations together but that's actually not his real plan. And so 
the idea is that you don't really show your cards. The mafia doesn't show their cards. And one of the ways that you can get what you want is to tell people you want something different than what you want, uh, but maneuver to get what you want. Of course, that would be completely unchristian. It's deception. But this is how Satan works. And people who are unconverted can work in this manner, believing because the goal is worthy, um, that the, the methodology is is fine. The end justifies the means. And we saw this with Parminder, um, freely admitting that he was had deceived people as to his uh, political leanings, that he was a leftist, but he never would uh, show his hand in that way. He would act as a conservative. And he felt that there was nothing wrong with that deception. And, and we know, of course, all deception is is sin, right? To deceive people. Uh, you, the end does not justify the means. Okay. <clears throat> so anyway, he's going to give a concrete example here. Of late years, there's been a definite change of emphasis in the ministry, the ministry, ministry magazine, and not for the better. The change coincides with the period in which our leaders have been in close contact and rapport with the evangelicals. The trend was in evidence before, but now has blossomed. So maybe it hasn't borne fruit, but it's blossomed as an example of this. I shall call attention to an article in the February 1957 issue entitled The Priestly Application of the Atoning Act. It is claimed that it is the Adventist understanding of the atonement confirmed and illustrated and clarified by the spirit of prophecy as it had not been renounced or protested we may justly conclude that it is officially approved <clears throat> uh, the author gives a short tribute to the magnifying glass the spirit of prophecy and goes on to state that the atonement is not is not on the one hand limited just to the sacrificial death of Christ on the cross. The quote should be at the beginning of this. It is not on the one hand limited just to the sacrifice, sacrificial death of Christ on the cross. On the other hand, neither is it confined to the ministry of our heavenly high priest in the sanctuary above on the antitypical day of atonement or hour of God's judgment. As some of our forefathers first uh, erroneous, erroneously thought and wrote. So this is what's quoted from the Ministry Magazine, February 1957, page 9. And you, you could probably find these issues. All the ministry articles are online. The author stresses the fact that the spirit of prophecy clearly teaches that both these aspects are included, one aspect being incomplete without the other, and each being the indispensable complement of the other. And that's, again, quoted from there, that one part. That is, both the death on the cross and Christ's ministry in the second apartment are necessary for atonement. With this, we are in full agreement. The death was a necessary part of the atonement, but one is incomplete without the other. And this point should be noted. For a few sentences further on, the author will say that the death on the cross is complete in itself. To quote, the sacrificial act of the cross is complete perfect, and final atonement for man's sin. Page 10 from the article. After having first said that the sacrificial death was incomplete, he now says it is complete, perfect, and final. He does not consider the death merely as a partial atonement, but a complete and perfect and final one. With this, we disagree. The two statements are irreconcilable. This is more than merely an unfortunate wording. Well, in the next paragraph, the author gives lip service to the need of administration in the sanctuary above. He leaves out every essential feature of the atonement and omits the dates, which are essential to the Adventist concept of the atonement, which justifies our existence as a denominated people with the message for the world at this time. So, so what people will say, what, what this article is saying is that that they are both the, the death on the cross and the work of Christ's ministry in heaven are part of the atonement, that they don't stand on their own. And yet he wants to have this statement that the sacrificial act of the cross is complete, perfect, and final atonement for man's sin. 
Now, we can say that the sacrifice was completed, but the atonement is not completed, right? So obviously you slay the animal, like in the, in the type, right? But atonement is not done just by slaying the animal. Something has to be done with the blood. It's either going to be poured out at the base of the altar, or it's going to be sprinkled um, in different places in the sanctuary, right? Uh, sin, or sometimes the priest will eat the animal. So sin is going to be transferred in type to the sanctuary. The sanctuary becomes defiled by sins, right? So that's what happens in your regular sacrifices. Now we have, of course, on the Day of Atonement, we have the Lord's goat and the scapegoat. Now the Lord's goat has no sins confessed upon it, and it goes in to cleanse the sanctuary. So this is another sacrifice itself. So, so we can say that Jesus died on the cross. He, he, he fulfilled all these sacrifices. The sacrifice for the atonement is complete. But it is not a complete final atonement. Right? So people play around with these words. And if you're not careful, you fall into this trap. And of course... They can they can let this language plant these seeds that are then going to spread and, and grow, sprout and grow and blossom and bear fruit in our history. So it's not just unfortunate wording. It's actually an, an idea that they're trying to slip in. And, and language is very important. How we say things is important. Um, but they're 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 using uh one is language that's incompatible. You, know, you can't have it both ways. In this explanation of Christ's work in the sanctuary, he does not refer to or mention Daniel 8.14, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Without this text, Christ's work in the sanctuary becomes meaningless. He does not mention 457 BC or the seven weeks or the middle of the week, which pinpoints the time of the sacrifice on the cross. And is as a nail in a sure place, Isaiah 22, 23, to which we fasten the whole chronological scheme in prophecy, and which also justifies the date 1844. Remove or change these dates, and Adventists are without an anchor for the chronological system climaxing in 1844, and are unable to justify their existence as a people who are to proclaim this most important message to the world for this time. Fear God. And give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. Revelation 14, 7. Every one of these dates, the author leaves out. And what remains in the word words of Dr. Barnhouse is flat, stale, and unprofitable. Which is um, that evangelical minister, the editor of Eternity Magazine. So the Eternity Extra September. Um, I don't think that's 1058. I think it's 1958, page 4. Okay, in Questions and Doctrine, uh, beginning on page 661, there is a section consisting of collections from the writings of Sister White on the subject of atonement, 30 pages in all. Now, I remember reading these, reading through these um, back 40-some years ago. It claims to be a comprehensive assemblage of Sister White's teachings on the atonement. From the use of the word comprehensive, I expected to find a full and extensive collection, but in consulting this material, I was disappointed in its paucity and one-sidedness. I found it to be very incomplete and meager collection, leaving out numerous quotations that rightly belong, even in a small compilation, not to say a comprehensive one. And strangely enough, quotations that were omitted were such as must on no account be left out. First of all, I wanted to know what Sister White had to say of the date 1844, which is the crisis year. I wanted to know if it had anything particularly to do with the atonement or if I could safely or if it could safely be left out. I found that the one author had admitted it. So I looked in turn for another for other quotations, not one of which I found in the assemblage. I looked for the statement at the termination of the 2300 days in 1844, our great high priest enters the Holy of Holies, and there appears in the presence of God to perform the work of the investigative judgment and to make an atonement for all who are shown to be entitled to its benefits. This is said to be the great 
Day of Final Atonement, Great Controversy, page 480. I searched for this important statement in the comprehensive assemblage, but it was not there. I looked for the parallel statement. At the termination of the 2300 days in 1844, Christ entered the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to perform the closing work of atonement preparatory to his coming. Uh, again, from a Great Controversy, page 422. I did not find it. I looked for this statement. This is the service which began when the 2300 days ended. At that time, as foretold by Daniel the prophet, our high priest entered the most holy to perform the last division of his solemn work, to cleanse the sanctuary. I could not find it. I looked for the statement. The end of the 2300 days in 1844 marked an important crisis. Great Controversy 429. I did not find it. I looked for other statements, such as the sacred work of Christ that is going on at the present time in the heavenly sanctuary. The atoning work of Christ is now in progress in the heavenly sanctuary. Today he is making atonement for us before the Father. That's from Testimonies, Volume 5, page 220, White Board Minutes, a whole list of things here. I found none of these quotes. At first, I thought that this book, Questions on Doctrine, did not have room for these texts, uh, nor did the Ministry Magazine. But I had to abandon this reasoning when I observed that it was only a particular kind of statements that was omitted. The omitted quotations all clustered about the important crisis date, 1844, the investigative judgment, Christ entering into the most holy for the final atonement, his making atonement now, his making atonement today before the Father. These are the statements that Don, Dr. Barnhouse ridiculed, and which he said our leaders had totally repudiated. He had also ridiculed Hiram Edson's experience in the cornfield, and had called the investigative judgment not only a peculiar, but a human face-saving idea. In fact, um, the most colossal psychological face-saving phenomenon in religious history. And of course, that's the accusation made regarding the resurrection of Christ as well by critics of Christianity. And now we found all these offending statements left out of the comprehensive assemblage. Can this be a mere coincidence? We wonder what effect the ridicule of the evangelicals had upon our leaders and upon the author of the article in the ministry, which we are discussing. One thing that kept our men from going overboard, body and soul, to the evangelicals was doubtless Mrs. White's writings. She's very emphatic on the question of the sanctuary, and it would not be easy to convert our people to the new view as long as they had the testimonies to sustain them in their old position. The faith of our people in the spirit of prophecy must be weakened, or better yet, destroyed, before much headway can be made in bringing in the new view. The ministry article serves well for this purpose. It was the editor himself who, in his research, had become acutely aware of the Ellen G. White statements, which indicate that the atoning work of Christ is now in progress in the heavenly sanctuary. That's from the White Minutes, page 1483. This did not at all fit in with the new view that the atonement was made on the cross, and so he suggested that footnotes or appendix notes might appear in certain of the Ellen G. White books, clarifying very largely, in the words of Ellen White, our understanding um, of the various phases of the atoning work of Christ. He suggested haste in the preparation and inclusion of such notes in future printings of the Ellen G. White books. When the plan became known, it was abandoned. And the author of the article in the February 1957 ministry then took over and had the article printed, which we are considering. The author asked this question, why in the early days, in the light of all this, did not Mrs. White point out and correct the limited or sometimes erroneous concept of some of our early writers concerning the atonement? And why did she employ some of their restricted phrases without contrasting at the time her own larger, truer meaning when using them? So this is a quote from Ministry, February 1957, page 11. This was the dilemma. Some of our early writers had erroneous concepts about the atonement, the author claims, and Sister White did not correct them, but even use some of their own restricted phrases. 
How could this be explained? The answer, which the author gives, is the most astonishing and astonishing answer. So I'm not sure why he repeats astonishing twice. That has ever been given to such a question. Hear this. In answer, it is essential that we first, we first of all remember this basic fact. No doctrinal truth or prophetic interpretation ever came to this people initially through the spirit of prophecy, not in a single case. Okay, so we have heard this, right? We've heard this type of thing. No doctrinal truth or prophetic interpretation ever came to this people initially through the spirit of prophecy. Is this true? Yes, that's true. She always uh, she said that, uh, that God waited for them to study it themselves and then confirm through her. Oh, no. If needed. What she says. Okay. When they I'm could go that. no further, then God gave her a vision to bring the light to this people. Okay. Yeah. So that's quite a different idea. So they, they take that story and twist it. She doesn't say to confirm what they had in their study. They often could go no further. They couldn't resolve issues. She was there to resolve. Now, God didn't just give us the spirit of prophecy to tell us all of our doctrines. We needed to study first. But there was a, a role that she played in establishing the truths of Adventism, especially when there was disagreement. So so this is one of those things that, that we've inherited, one of these lies. Read those words again and have in mind that this is an article which claims to give the true meaning of the atonement, the official interpretation, that it has the approval of the administration and that the editor passed it. Also, it has not been retracted or changed. It stands. These are bold words, almost unbelievable words and utterly untrue words to assert that Sister White never, not even in a single case, initially contributed any doctoral, doctrinal truth or prophetic interpretation will not be believed by her thousands and millions of readers who all have been benefited by her works. For myself, I've been greatly helped and instructed by her doctrinal teachings and prophetic interpretation. Even the author himself, who on page 11 of the February 1957 ministry says, we are fundamentally Protestants taking the Bible only as our sole rule of faith and practice. In a signed letter the next month, asserts, I take the total spirit of prophecy teachings on a given subject to be the authoritative Seventh-day Adventist teaching. It does not strengthen faith to have a writer say publicly the Bible and the Bible only and privately deny it. One statement is evidently made to the world for them to believe and the other to our people to quiet their fears. Some explanation is due. Right. So people are playing, you know, both sides. Right. The, the leaders are playing the sides of the evangelicals. But of course, they want to still maintain to be leaders. So they deceive. Parmander did the same thing. And we are not to do that type of thing. That is not God's way. That's politics. It's policy. Another word for it is is lying. The reader will have noted that the author does not say Sister White never contributed any doctrinal truth or prophetic interpretation. He says that she never contribute, contributed anything initially. That is, she never made any original contribution. She got it from somebody else. She lifted it. Our enemies have made that assertion for years, but I never thought that such would be announced to the whole world with the consent of the leaders. But here it is. Whatever Sister White wrote, be it in the Council of the Father and the Son in Eternity, or Satan's inmost rebellious thoughts, somebody told her, she never contributed a thing initially, never a single case. Let me produce a single case. The following is taken from Special Testimony, Series B, number two, page 56 and 57. Many of our people do not realize how firmly the foundation of our faith has been laid. My husband, Elder Joseph Bates, Father Pierce, Elder Edson, and others who were keen, noble, and true, were among those who, after the passing of the time in 1844, searched for the truth as for hidden treasure. I met with them, and we studied and prayed earnestly. 
Often we remain together until late at night, and sometimes through the entire night, praying for light and studying the word. Again and again, these brethren came together to study the Bible in order that we might know its meaning and be prepared to teach it with power. When they came to the point in their study where they said, we can do nothing more, the spirit of the Lord would come upon me. I would be taken off in vision and a clear explanation of the passages we had been studying would be given me with instruction as how we were to labor and teach effectively. Thus light was given that helped us to understand the scriptures in regard to Christ, his mission and his priesthood, a line of truth extending from time to time when she will, when when we shall enter the city of God was made plain to me and I gave others the instruction that the Lord had given me. So you can see that this is the quote we were talking about that is often twisted. The meaning of it is twisted to give the impression that she just was confirming what they had concluded, and it's not the case. In this case, there was no human intermediary, unless we are to believe. By I, what's that? Yes, so, I, do you think this is a sign for God's people today? You, you see their earnestness in, in searching for the truth. Mm -hmm. God gave her a vision. Do you think this is, can be the sign to God's people today? If they, you know, you're seeking and find me, search me all your heart. If you're searching and asking how they did, you think God will not bless his people along the way? Yes. And 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 the approach that we've taken to study in, in this group is that uh, one is we want to be corrected by God. Now, we don't have a prophet here to tell us, but we, we have God intervene many, many times um, and correct us. And so we're not looking to man to... to uh, solve the problems that we struggle with we're looking to god and to his word and of course we have the spirit of prophecy that can guide us as well but just you know it's written in the spirit of prophecy can i read you something that i was quoted before the lord's yeah. full, the full the lord's full favor comes to those who seek him with the whole heart and are willing to follow him in doing god's will and throwing christ in the heart planting his attributes deep in the life practices these have a constraining motive a supreme love for christ our savior which brings them sorry which brings even the thoughts into captivity i i just see when, when, when we've spoken about this before when we've told me about different problems in the other groups I, and i've said to you let's that's not christian and basically it's it, it it goes against the first angel message and without the first angel message we can't have the second we can't have the third and the same today, if if we can see a fault with you, Theodore, we've got a problem. But you have been very good over the year, times I've seen you. You always will question those things. Something like what you're saying with Paminda, you know, that, that's up to them. Um, but they have to work it out. We have to seek our own salvation with fear and trembling, as I was quoted before, Philippians 2, 12 and 13. For it's God that works with us. And if we, if we think it's us and not God, we've got a problem straight away. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, so, I mean, we believe that God is leading, has been leading this movement. And we believe in the spirit of prophecy that God has led Adventism. And so we have a foundation that has been laid. Now, obviously, in the early years of Adventism, they needed a living prophet to direct them. Because there were so many ideas out there. But the thing is, they needed to study, Right. God is not going to give them that light if they're not struggling over God's word. Right, see, right, through, right through the Bible, Theodore, God is leading his people. When, you, when I look, when I've read my Bible and look at Alan White, like when I first came into the Adventist church, I didn't want Alan White, but God gave me Alan White, and that taught me how to read, learn, the, learn the Bible. So if we're willing to open our whole heart, God will guide us whatever we need to learn. Yeah, and and, and we need to be... We need to know God individually and study individually. There is importance in studying together in fellowship um, because God isn't just leading an individual here and there. He's leading a people. And, and even though we can see that there's problems with what we would call the organized church, we're not, we're not ever seeking to start some new church or new, you know, we're not calling people out of Adventism because we believe this is God's church and God will take care of it. What our responsibility is, 
to be faithful to the things that he gives us. So we believe that God is leading all kinds of people all over the world that we have no particular communication with. But God is orchestrating and, and all of these people, he's orchestrating the movement with Christ as our head. And that's just the time in which we live. And, and we see that in the study that we're doing on the crisis ahead, um, which we do Sabbath. Um, and that that should always be what, what should God's people all the way through. As, as we're saying, the Bible does exactly the same thing. Those who are leading and, and being led by the Holy Spirit uh, are exactly what you say. Yeah. Yeah. So they we're all part of the body of Christ. We don't, I mean, God had a purpose for the organization, but that organization has abandoned God, but God still can work. And, and this is something I've understood for a long, long time is that we're not dependent upon the organization for salvation. We're dependent upon and even for direction and what to do. Amen. Um, we're connected to Christ. This so I am pretty clear on the yeah. statements. Yeah. Okay, well, let's go on and read. So I'll just read this paragraph again here. In this case, there was no human intermediary, unless we are to believe that Sister White did not tell the truth. She got her instructions from above. In this case, the instruction concerned Christ, his mission, and his priesthood, the very subjects we now we have now under consideration, right? So those are the things that she says in that quote. But thus the light was given that helped us to understand the scriptures in regard to Christ, his mission, and his priesthood. A line of truth extending from that time to the time that we shall enter the city of God, right? This is the thing that has been rejected. So what, what they are saying when they're saying that Ellen White, no truth ever came from her, what they're saying is the truths that came from her, we don't actually accept as truth, <laughs> Right? The, the things that are her, that God gave her, that she says God gave her, these are the things that actually, you know, we need to get rid of. We need to just stick to the Bible. So anything that we can't support from the Bible, in their mind, um, in their understanding of the Bible, we're going to say that that isn't truth. So only when Ellen White agrees with our interpretation of the Bible was she led of God. When she disagrees with our interpretation of the Bible, she just has human ideas, right? That she was influenced by others. So it's it's always an attack on the spirit of prophecy. Whatever we may be or not be sure of, we know now that the instruction that came that came to Sister White on the subject of Christ, his mission, and his priesthood came direct from God. This means that the sanctuary question, as our forefathers taught and believed, believed it, has God for its author. It came as a result of a vision, which I do not believe can be said of any other doctrine we hold. So a crisis. Uh, we have reached a crisis in this denomination when leaders are attempting to enforce false doctrine and threaten those who object. The whole program is unbelievable. Men are now attempting to remove the foundations of many generations and think they can succeed. If we did not have the spirit of prophecy, we would not know of the departure from sound doctrine, which is now threatening us, and the coming of the Omega, which will decimate our ranks and cause grievous wounds. The present situation has been clearly outlined. We are nearing the climax. I am well aware that oft times visions were given to confirm previous study. I'm well aware that for some time, Sister White's mind was locked, as she expressed it, and that hence visions were given as in the instance here considered. She herself says that for two or three years, my mind continued to be locked to an understanding of the scriptures. During that time, the Lord gave visions. Then an experience came to her, and she records, from that time to this, I've been able to understand the word of God. Now, so this is one of those other statements that's kind of twisted. So what she's saying is that she didn't have a personal understanding of the scriptures. She couldn't understand it, but God gave her visions. So that means that the understanding did not come from her mind, 
but from God directly. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Now, this is sort of twisted in by other people that sort of, well, she didn't, um, you know, she didn't understand the scriptures and, and, and then the visions were given to confirm what the other people had studied. Right. So that's, that's where they kind of mix these statements together and twist them. During that time, the Lord gave, um, visions. Then an experience came to her and she records from that time to this, I've been unable, I've been able to understand the word of God. Uh, for two or three years, Mrs. White's mind was locked. This was evidently intended by God to strengthen their faith in the gift. For the men knew that of herself, she had no knowledge. Then when they came to the end of their knowledge and did not know what to do, light came from a source of which they knew that of herself, she could not solve their problems. It was clearly the Lord's leading and they confessed it and accepted as light from heaven. The revelation was given in an attempt to protect herself. The author now turns completely around and says that she frequently went far beyond the positions taken by any of the original advocates and her counsels would often be so clear, so full and so far reaching that they proved to be far ahead of the concepts of any of her contemporaries, sometimes 50 years in advance of their acceptance by some. I wonder whom she copied under such circumstances. In composing the book, Questions on Doctrine, it became necessary to do some research work in Sister White's published and unpublished manuscripts to ascertain beyond a doubt just what she had said on various subjects. This work was turned over to the ministry author, who reports as follows in the ministry for February 1957. So, so this is when they composed the book Questions on Doctrine, they did all this research work, right? Can I just say something here, Theodore? Basically, what Ellen White's um, experience here is similar to what mine. Said, I said, when I came into the church, I wanted Bible and Bible only, but God directed me to Sister White's writings, which directed me to, 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 to the Someone's Bible. Someone's alarm. But, but it's something that, uh, don't take this the wrong way, uh, the Bible, the written word, John 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. What's the difference? Between Christ and the word? No difference. Yes. Absolutely. So this is actually John, sorry, Revelation 118. I, I'm Peter that liveth and was dead. We have to remember, not, let's not get the Holy Spirit out of this, because the Holy Spirit will say nothing that is not written in the Word. So basically, the Holy Spirit is leading everyone who will open their heart, and he knows he knows the ones who are opening their heart 100%. And basically, when I look at what Alan White did here, when, when I first came into the church, I had visions in the church. I didn't tell anyone, but I thought they're going to think I've gone crazy. No one was telling me these things happen, but we have a Holy Spirit that will guide anyone. I knew nothing. I didn't even know the books of the Bible were, but God showed me. And basically, my foundation now is the word, but Alan White is my, my favorite. As she said, the lesser light pointing to the greater light. Yeah, because, I mean, our foundation is upon the word of God, but she's she is, she is in a sense, the word of God as well, because she is a prophet. She's not... People try to weaken what Ellen White's uh, authority, she has authority uh, to those that accept the spirit of prophecy. Obviously, to the world, uh, she doesn't have that same authority, right? This is the thing I found. The three all work together. The Holy Spirit, the, 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 the Word of God, Jesus Christ, Ellen White, all, I, I, I recognize them all to be the same. Yeah, yeah. And and we know that, you know, no prophecy of scriptures of any private interpretation for holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Spirit has to be there to interpret God's word. Not a church, not a pope, not an organization, not a group of scholars, but the Holy Spirit is the one uh, that we have to listen to. Now, sure, there's going to be individuals who can be misguided and believe the Holy Spirit's teaching them. Uh, but when it plainly contradicts God's word, I have all kinds of people who write me all the time and, and have some revelation they're a prophet or whatever. And yet plain statements of scripture, they reject because it doesn't fit in with their thinking. Yep, Felix. Uh, I, I'm, I'm agreeing. I, I, I basically, I, I recognize when I was reading the Bible, and then when I read Rellen White's writings, I recognize 
the same mm -hmm. the same spirit there. Yeah. Okay. So um, the further question was like in, was likewise arisen. Just why were these councils, clarifications, and expositions on the atonement and its priestly manifestations not brought together for our use before this? The answer, we believe, is equally simple and straightforward and obvious. No one had taken the time for the sustained effort involved in laborious, comprehensive search necessary to find, analyze, and organize it. This is from the ministry um, report on the book, Seventh-day Adventist Answered Questions on Doctrine. So this is what they're saying. Since our leaders were largely unaware of this latent evidence of its priceless value, the need was not felt and the time required for such a vast project was not considered available. Access to the complete files of all the old periodicals containing Ellen White's 2000 articles is not easy for there is no complete file in one place. Now, of course we do, but um, more than that, the priceless manuscript statements are not available in published form. Further, as a church, we have been so engrossed in giving our special message to the world in keeping with our complex movement rolling outward or onward in its multiple activities that no one seemed to have the time or even the burden for such a huge task. It was known that the search would be a most laborious one because of the vast amount of material that must be compassed. However, when the need clearly arose and the time for such a search had obviously come, uh, the necessity was recognized and the time taken to compass not only the familiar book statements, but the vast array of periodicals, articles and manuscript councils bearing thereon. So now, Andreasen is going to comment. It will be noted that the author does not minimize the task that faced him, and it was a great task. It is to be it is it is to be regretted that he should take the opportunity to inform us that the leaders had not felt the need of this work did not have time for it and did not even have any burden for it. It was this research that they, it was in this research that they discovered that Mrs. White did not contradict or change what she said in the beginning of her work. The author puts it in his peculiar phraseology that Mrs. White's later statements do not contradict or change her earlier expressions. He had evidently hoped that she had changed her position on the atonement which position he had criticized and attempted to explain by saying that she never, not even in a single case, had contributed in anything initially to doctrine and prophetic interpretation. It is clear that if she intended to change her position, she had abundant opportunity to do so in the 60 or more years she lived after making her position clear on the atonement. But she did not contradict or change what she had once written. And this is the testimony of the very one who had challenged her earlier position and who now is compelled to testify that she did not change. It is a poetic justice that the author of the ministry article should be the one to testify after he had examined all the material that there is no evidence that she ever changed her mind or contradicted what she had written earlier. This created a dilemma for our author. He must now let stand all that she had ever written and could not argue that she had authorized any change whatsoever. What then could he do, or did he do? A most unique solution he had. He calmly asserted that Sister White did not mean what she said. Note again this peculiar use of the English language, not a direct statement, but a passive approach. He says, a distinct clarification of terms and meaning emerges that is destined to have far-reaching consequences. Her later statements invest those earlier terms with a larger, truer meaning inherently there all the time. And so he explains when he says that Christ is making atonement, he is omitting the word now. She is obviously meaning applying the completed atonement to the individuals. Emphasis is now we don't actually have an emphasis here, but this is in complete harmony with the statement in Questions on Doctrine, where the author boldly asserts that if anyone hears the Adventists say, or reads in Adventist literature, even in the writings of Ellen White, that Christ is making atonement now, it should be understood that we mean simply that Christ is making application of the benefits of the sacrificial atonement he made on the cross. This is news indeed. I've written several books, one of them on the sanctuary service, and hence, these may come under what he calls Adventist literature. And now some unauthorized individual proclaims to the world 
that when I say that Christ is making atonement now, I do not mean it. I mean that he is making application, but not atonement, which was made 1800 years ago. However, it is only a minor matter um, that he presumes to act as my interpreter uh, and tell what I mean by what I say. Uh, but when he undertakes to tell the world that Sister White says Christ is making atonement, she means simply that he is making application. That is serious. God's reproof to Joe when he was talking uh, too much may apply here. Who is he that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Job 38.1. It is not often that God is sarcastic, but here he is. Read verse 21. Job deserved it. And so when I read, even in the writings of Ellen G., even in the writings of Ellen G. White, that Christ is making atonement, I do not believe it. He made the atonement 1800 years ago, not now. And even if she affirms that Christ is making atonement now, that today he is making atonement, that we are in the great day of atonement and the sacred work of Christ for the people of God that is going on at the present time, 1882, in the heavenly sanctuary should be our constant study. I'm still to apply to the interpreter to find out what she means. Such is playing with words. It is playing with fire and makes any interpretation impossible or any interpretation possible, pardon me. If the author is right, I am permitted to take any word of any author and say that he means something else than what he says. Such makes intercommunication impossible and the world a babble. What would agreements amount to or contracts or words of mouth if I am permitted to put my own interpretation on what another man says? The Bible says that the seventh day is the Sabbath. That seems plain enough. But the author's theory would permit me to hold the Bible to mean no, that the Bible means no such thing. Absurd, you say, and I say, amen. When the Bible says seven, it does not mean one. When the author's philosophy, however, with the author's, author's philosophy, however, Words become meaningless. Let your nay be nay and your yea, yea, James says. That is, mean what you say. To make the plain statement that Christ is making atonement now means that he is making application now is indefensible on grammatical, philological, theological, or common sense ground. And to go farther and upon such false interpretation, uh, build a new theology to be enforced by sanctions is simply out of this world. Undue assumption of authority coupled with overconfidence in the virtue of bestowed honors have borne fruit, and the fruit is not good. We're seeing how much more we got. Okay, so we're going to read up to this uh, part where we get to Crozier. The present attempt to lessen and dis destroy confidence in the spirit of prophecy and establish a new theology may deceive some, even many, but the foundations upon which we have built these many years still stands and God still lives. The warning should not go unheeded. If you lessen the confidence of God's people in the testimonies he has sent them, you are rebelling against God as certainly as were Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Testimonies for the Church, volume 5, page 66. In an incomplete research that I, which I conducted years ago, I found what the author found and more. Among other things, I found in a small pamphlet entitled A Word to the Little Flock, published by James White in Brunswick, Maine, May 30th, 1847, a statement by Sister White on the sanctuary that immediately drew my attention. It is dated April 21st, 1847, and written from Topsham, Maine. On page 12, I found these words, which I suppose our ministry author also found. Says Sister White, I believe the sanctuary to be cleansed at the end of the 2300 days is the new Jerusalem temple of which Christ is a minister. The Lord showed me in vision more than a year ago that Brother Crozier had the true light on the cleansing of the sanctuary, etc. And that it was his will that Brother Crozier should write out the view which he gave in the Day Star Extra, February 7th, 1846. I feel fully authorized by the Lord to recommend that extra. Uh, to every saint, I pray that these lines may prove a blessing to you and to all the dear children who may read them, signed Ellen G. White. I lost no time to get a copy of that extra and read it. As I write this, I have before me a photostatic copy of the Daystar Extra for February 7th, 1846. 
but on page 40 and 41 of that issue, I read Brother Car Crozier's article. After having discussed certain theories in which he does not believe, Brother Crozier ob observes. So we're going to look at this uh, next week. We're going to spend a bit of time uh, with Crozier. Um, uh, and it relates also to our mor morning studies. Because one is we have here an endorsement of, of an article in a particular part of that article, um, a particular point dealing with the light on the sanctuary. So we're going to look at that, but I don't want to go too long here. A any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay, let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the Sabbath and for the fellowship that we can have. We pray for the studies tomorrow, for Dwight's study on the minor prophets and last day events, and for the study of dealing with the crisis ahead. We know, Lord, that you are preparing us, that you are teaching us, and we pray, Lord, that your purposes can be worked out. Help us to follow and serve you each day. And may this Sabbath truly be a blessing. May we enter into that rest that Christ has promised to give us, and that we can have rest from our sins, that we can have clear consciences, and that we can um, hear your voice speaking to us and guiding us. Thank you for each person. Bless them and keep them. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.